Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. I get the impression everyone feels the way I do, <laughs> which is less than chipper. Yeah. However, it's good that we're all here. We all bring the elements. Psalm 50, verses 4 through 6. He calls to the heavens above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather to me, my faithful ones, who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. Father in heaven, we come to you at this time to honor and praise your name. We thank you, Father, that we are here safely. We pray for those above of our number who are not here for travel purposes or personal reasons or medical reasons. We pray that your loving hand will be upon them and we can gather together at the next time and enjoy their fellowship as well. We pray, Father, that as we enter into this time of service, that the songs will we sing, we'll praise your name will encourage us and teach us. We pray, Father, that with this storm, that we will be safe. And that we will see that your power is at hand and that you are in control and that you are the creator in control of the all. We thank you, Father, that we have days like today that, that remind us of that. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your son that died on the cross. We pray that his name is honored today as we pray through him. One hundred ninety-seven. <clears throat> One ninety-seven. <clears throat> Die on the tree, 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 tree,
to say the name of course
snowstorm if it were. <clears throat> As it is, you know, I don't know if it's my back injury or the fact that I'm getting older or what's going on, but I feel this storm in my back. So it just makes me sound like an old person. Yeah, welcome to the club. Yeah, you're not old yet. <laughs> Give it a few years. Yeah. Oh goodness! Speaking of uh, the weather and such, um, I spoke with I think everybody that normally goes to the nursing home <clears throat> with us on second Sundays, and the general consensus is we're going to call and not show up. We're going to cancel the nursing home visits today because of this weather. It's just, it's hard to drive out there right now. It really is. Um, well, I don't know from experience this morning because I didn't drive here. Marie drove me here this morning and then went and picked up her mom and Carolyn. But uh, yeah. it's just nasty out there. I opened the car door and it just flew open. I'm surprised it didn't bend backwards. It was rolling so hard. I should have just kept a handle on it. Anyway, God knows what he's doing. There's a reason for this. Don't know what it is, but that's okay. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for bringing us here safely today. Thank you for this place that we have where we can gather and be comfortable and to study your word and sing songs of praise and worship to you. Father, help us during this time as we, we look at your word, studying about sacrifice. Help us to piece together the information that is available to us. And help us to understand what you're teaching us. Father, be with me at this time Help me to speak your words from this message that I've prepared and help me to not get in the way 
of your message. Most of all, Father, we thank you for your Son, who is the sacrifice for our sins. In Jesus' name. Most of us know the story of Noah. After Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden and they were kicked out, they began to populate the earth. They had many children, and they had children, and they had children. You get the picture. But the problem was that people continued to sin. Cain, Adam and Eve's first son, had murdered his brother Abel because God didn't accept his offering, but he did accept Abel's. God let Cain live, but made him to wander and made it so that his crops wouldn't thrive. Eventually, Cain built a city for his descendants, and they were all basically just evil. One of them even wrote a poem for his wife, bragging about having murdered someone. How romantic. Over time, things just got worse and worse. And God finally had to do something about it. So he decided to start with a clean slate. He told Noah to build a big boat and to take animals with him in the boat, along with his wife, his three sons, and his three daughters-in-law, their wives. And they would repopulate the earth. Now most people think that Noah was told to take mated pairs of each animal, but what God really told him was this in Genesis 7, verses 2 and 3. Take with you seven pairs of all clean animals, the male and his mate, and a pair of the animals that are not clean the male and his mate, and seven pairs of the birds of the heavens also, male and female, to keep their offspring alive on the face of all the earth. Now that's a little more complex than, than just a pair of each kind of animal. But notice the specification of clean versus unclean animals. Now we don't have an explanation of that in the Bible yet, but in Leviticus, we are told the difference between the clean and the unclean animals. Basically, if an animal has a cloven hoof, the hoof that has two pieces, and the animal and the animal chews its cud, then it's considered a clean animal. It has to do both. It can't do one or the other. There are other differentiations, but these two things together are the major identifying factors for clean versus unclean animals. So Noah was told basically to take seven pairs of cows, sheep, and goats, and animals like that, but only one pair of camels, lions, wolves, and animals like that. Also, he was told to bring seven pairs of birds. We don't usually think about birds being on the ark, but it kind of makes sense if the land was completely covered with water. But why seven pairs of the clean animals? What was the purpose for that? Well, God doesn't say up front, but after the flood is over and everything is dried up and Noah has come out of the ark, we find out why. This is in Genesis 8, verse 20. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Now, if you think about it, Noah and his family had just gone through the most epic disaster in human history. Everything they knew from before was completely gone washed off the face of the earth. Even the geography that they knew was gone. All that they had was what was in the ark. The animals and the birds, some of every kind of food, which is also specified in chapter 7, 
So basically seeds for planting. But they had been in the ark for a year. So just to point this out, this is the first mention of building an altar in the Bible. The story about Cain and Abel and their offering to God. We assume that there is an altar. There's no mention of how their gifts were offered to God. We don't know if they were burnt or how they were presented. We also don't know how many of each of the clean animals and birds Noah sacrificed. We're only told some. The Hebrew says something like, he took from among the clean animals and birds as burnt offerings on the altar. It's really not very specific. But imagine the faith that Noah had to have to sacrifice some of those animals. They're the last ones left in the world. And sacrifice them as a burnt offering to God. Especially since God had just approved eating meat instead of being required to be vegetarian. But there was a response to Noah's faithful sacrifice, and that's in the very next verse, chapter 8, verse 21. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. Now, this is one key point of the burnt offerings, the sacrifices that were completely burned up on the altar. They were always referred to as a pleasing aroma to God. Now, part of the Hebrew phrase for sacrificing a burnt offering includes the verb to ascend, implying the smoke and the aroma of the burnt offering rising up to God. Now, in this instance, God replies verbally to Noah's sacrifice with a new covenant between God and the entire earth that the events of the flood will never happen again. God will never wipe almost all of humanity off the earth again to start over by flooding the earth and wiping it clean. Details matter here in this verse. God says he won't strike down every living creature the way that he had done with the flood. Some have looked at God saying, I will never again curse the ground because of man as lifting the curse that he placed on Adam in the garden because of Adam's sin, but that's not the case. If you ever tried to plant a garden, you'd know that. But the best case is lifting the curse that he placed on Cain and his descendants and saying that he won't do that again. But that doesn't mean that everything's going to be rosy from here on out. We know a lot happened after the flood until Abraham's time. Scholars disagree on how long it was from the flood until God chose Abram and told him to leave Ur. Some say it's around 450 years. Some say as many as 1,700 years between the flood and Abram. No matter how long it was, the devout followers of God continued to obey him like Noah had before the flood. Now there's a lot of a lot of things specific to Abram that we read in Genesis, specifically pointing out his skills and his blessings. He was a great warrior, leading a small band of soldiers to free his nephew Lot when Lot had been taken captive. Abram met with God several times and entered into covenant relationships with him. And he was told by God that he would be the father of many nations. And eventually, when he was 100 years old, he and his wife, Sarah, had a child that they named Isaac. 
Abraham knew that Isaac was the child that God had promised him and that his descendants would be counted through Isaac. Let's pick up reading in Genesis 22, verses 1 and 2. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. And he said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Now, these are some of the most counterintuitive verses in the Bible for a lot of people. Nowhere else in the Bible does God ask for a human or child sacrifice. Nowhere. In fact, God tells Moses and the children of Israel that sacrificing children to Molech is an abomination. So what is God, what, what here God is asking Abraham to do is counter to anything and everything that we read before and after in the Bible. This is out of character. God tells Abraham to take his son that he promised Abraham would be the progenitor of all his descendants that God promised him. Take him up on a mountain and kill him as a burnt offering. And the Hebrew here is the same as when Noah offered the burnt offering after the flood. And also the same as the twice daily burnt offerings that were being done at the tabernacle and then at the temple. This is a whole burnt offering. The thing being offered is to be completely burnt up on the altar. God sends Abraham again to a particular location, just like when he called him out of the land of Ur, to one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. In other words, just start walking, and I'll let you know when you're in the right spot. God sends Abraham with Isaac, but he will be more specific when Abraham gets to the destination. Verses 3 through 5, Genesis 22. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And they cut the wood for the burnt offering, and arose, and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted, lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. So Abraham, two of his servants, and his son Isaac all headed out from where they were staying to the place called Moriah to a mountain that would be specified when they got there. Abraham brings the wood for the offering, and it seems that Abraham rides his donkey while the other three walk the three days to the destination that God tells Abraham about. When they have traveled for three days, Abraham sees the destination in the distance, so he leaves the two servants behind and the donkey and takes Isaac with him to go up on the mountain to worship God. So Abraham and Isaac prepare to go up on the mountain to worship. Verses 6 through 8. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went both of them together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them together. 
part of the preparation is that Abraham puts the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's back. Isaac becomes the beast of burden to transport the wood to the place of the sacrifice. Abraham takes two important things with him to be able to, to perform the sacrifice. The knife to slaughter the sacrifice and the fire to light the wood. Now remember, there's no matches. Uh, matches weren't invented until the 1800s. And this isn't happening in, this is happening before the Iron Age. This is mid-Bronze Age. So flint and steel is not an option for starting a fire. Abraham probably had what's called a fire pot. It's an earthenware pot that is well insulated that holds some large coals that he would be able to use to get some tinder started to start the fire. As they're making the trek to the final location for the sacrifice, Isaac asks what would be the obvious question. Where's the lamb? What are we going to sacrifice? Abraham's response demonstrates his faith in God. One of two things had to happen in Abraham's mind. Either God was going to provide a lamb for the sacrifice, or he was going to sacrifice Isaac the way God asked, and then God performs some miracle and brings Isaac back so that he can be Abraham's heir. Those were the only two options. Verses 9 and 10. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there, and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife, to slaughter his son. So they arrive at the location that God told Abraham to make the sacrifice. And Abraham builds an altar. Building an altar is not a simple task. The assumption is that the process was the same as it would be when God tells the Israelites that they would build an altar from uncut stones and earth. So Abraham would have taken stones that were nearby and built a raised altar, maybe two or three feet high, and made sure that it was big enough for Isaac to lay down on. Next, he would lay out the wood on the altar and make it so that the fire would quickly start burning the wood and the sacrifice on the altar. Then Abraham does the unthinkable. He binds Isaac and puts him on the wood on the altar. The fire is the last step of the sacrifice. So Abraham takes out the knife to kill Isaac on the altar to prepare him to be a burnt offering to God. Now the Hebrew word here that is translated as slaughter is the same word used to describe the killing of any sacrificial animal throughout the books of Exodus and Leviticus. It's also the same word used to describe the killing of enemies in battle. Abraham was ready to obey God's command to kill the son that was promised to him, the heir that was to provide the descendants that would outnumber the sand on the seashore. And now he has the knife raised and ready to go. Verses 11 through 13. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the wood or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And 
And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. God had commanded Abraham to kill his son, his only son whom he loved. Abraham went to the place where God wanted him to perform the sacrifice. Back in verse 1, we're told that this was to test Abraham to see if he would truly obey God based on everything that had happened with Abraham up to this point. According to the writer of Hebrews, Abraham believed that God could replace Isaac somehow once the sacrifice was completed. So he knew that it was okay to do what God had commanded. God had given Abraham his only son Isaac as a gift. There was no natural way that this could have happened. It was miraculous. Since God gave the gift, it was his to take back. But instead of taking the gift back, he reaffirmed the gift because of Abraham's faith. His faith that God provides what he promises. God sent a ram to replace Isaac as the sacrifice. God sent that ram to be a suitable substitute for Isaac in the sacrifice that he commanded Abraham to make. Abraham's faith, like the faith of Noah, that God would continue to provide food for him and his family when some of the clean animals from the ark were sacrificed as a burnt offering to God, was rewarded by God, in effect giving him back his son that he had originally promised Abraham. Now this sacrifice, like the one Noah did, seemed to be connected with the covenant that God had with these two men. But covenants aren't just between God and men. But men have covenants between themselves as well. The next sacrifice that I want to talk about is also in Genesis, but it's, it's different. It's not a burnt offering. It more follows the description in Leviticus of a peace offering. Remember Jacob? That's Isaac's son, so we're skipping a generation here. Remember how he went to find a wife? And then he fell in love with a shepherdess who, who got him some water. But then her father tricked him into marrying her older sister before he could marry the love of his life. Her father, Laban, was a, a bit of a shyster. Just a bit. Laban tried to trick him out of his wife. Then his flock that he agreed would be payment for his service over the 20 years that he served after marrying Rachel and Leah. Jacob's solution for the problem was to pack up and leave when Laban was out working in the fields. He packed up his family, his flocks, and what belongings they could take, and he headed back west to Canaan where he had grown up. Jacob had a head start, but Laban finally caught up with him after about a week of travel. After a lot of haggling, Laban agrees to let them go. But he warned Jacob that no matter what he did, Jacob's wives would still be Laban's daughters, and their children would always be his grandchildren. So he's, he's grasping for possessions here. So they made a covenant. They made a treaty between them. Jacob set up a stone, a pillar, and Laban made a heap of stones as a monument to their treaty. Pick up reading in 31, <coughs> Genesis 31, starting in verse 48. Laban said, this heap is a witness between you and me today. Therefore he named it Galid and Mizpah, for he said, the Lord watch between you and me when we are out of one another's sight. If you oppress my daughters, or if you take wives besides my daughters, 
although no one is with us, see, God is witness between you and me. Do you remember when, when the Mizpah coins were a thing? We got one. I guess you, you can still get them. They still sell them. They're coins that are cut in half that have the words of verse 49 inscribed on them. I always thought they were a romantic thing for when a couple had to be separated. Here's another example of why context is important. What Laban, Laban says here is more of a threat than a heartfelt thing because of what he says in verse 50. Basically, he's saying, God is watching. And if you abuse my daughters or turn your back on them and then marry somebody else, God will know and will hold you accountable because you promised that that wouldn't happen. There was obviously a lot of bad blood between Jacob and Laban. And I, I understand why. Laban did everything that he could to keep the advantage over Jacob and even tried to cheat Jacob out of what he had promised him. So now they would be separated. <clears throat> Verses 51 and 52. Then Laban said to Jacob, See this heap and the pillar which I have set between you and me. This heap is a witness, and the pillar is a witness, that I will not pass over this heap to you and you will not pass over this heap and this pillar to me to do harm. Laban and Jacob set a boundary between them. They had a border. Laban wouldn't pass west of the marker, and Jacob would not pass farther east than the marker. Even though Rachel and Leah were still Laban's daughters, he would not allow their husband to come anywhere near where he lived. Maybe Laban did it because he thought Jacob was stealing from him, and he wanted to protect his wealth. But Jacob was furious with Laban because of the accusations especially after spending 20 years slaving for him and taking care of everything that he owned. To solemnize the agreement, the treaty between them, Laban invoked God as the judge of the covenant. Let's look at uh, verses 53 and 54. The God of Abraham and the God of Nahor, the God of their father, Judge between us. So Jacob swore by the fear of his father Isaac. And Jacob offered a sacrifice in the hill country and called his kinsmen to eat bread. They ate bread and spent the night in the hill country. So Laban uses the name of their ancestors, who were brothers, to describe God rather than using the name of God which has made some people speculate that he was referring to two different gods. Jacob, however, swore by the God of Isaac. Finally, there was a ritual sacrifice to close the deal. It doesn't specify what was sacrificed, but given the flocks of Jacob were right there, it was probably a sheep or a goat. But again, this was not a burnt offering. The last sentence says that they ate bread, but the word translated as bread is actually a general term used to mean food, or they shared a meal. And given that they had made a sacrifice and then ate, they followed the pattern of a peace offering that is given in Leviticus. The peace offering, with the peace offering, the person brings the sacrifice the person that brings the sacrifice gets a portion of it back and then cooks it and eats it and shares it with those that are with him. In this case, it would be to seal the peace treaty 
between Laban and Jacob. Sacrifices were an important part of worship. They demonstrated the faith of the person who was offering the sacrifice, and they also showed the, their obedience to God. But they were also a way to close a deal, to demonstrate the importance of a, of a covenant agreement by sharing a valuable animal through sacrifice to God and a covenant meal together. Just like God asked Abraham to sacrifice his only son, he gave, God gave his only son as a sacrifice for all mankind. The blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross provides a payment for our sins. It all boils down to belief and trust. Belief that Jesus is the Son of God, trusting that he died as the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Belief that he rose again on the third day, and belief that he ascended into heaven to sit at God's right hand to intercede for those who are in him. And if you believe all of that, and you're willing to repent, to turn away from a sinful life, then you can be immersed in water, baptized to wash away your sins, and then you will come up out of the water. When you do, you'll be a new person, and you can learn to obey Jesus more and more each day. If you want to know more about that, or if there's some way that we can help, let me know. Let's stand together. How I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed through his infinite mercy, his child and forever I am. Redeemed, 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 redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed, 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 his child and forever I am. So happy in Jesus, no language my rapture can tell. I know that the light of his presence with me doth continually dwell. Redeem, 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 redeem by the blood of the Lamb. Redeem, 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 his child and forever I am. I know I shall see in his beauty the King in whose light I delight, who lovingly guardeth my footsteps and giveth me songs in the night. Redeem, 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 redeem by the blood of the Lamb. Redeem, 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 his child and forever I am. Three hundred eighty-three. Three eight three. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There, the precious fountain, free to all a healing stream. Flows from Calvary's mountain in the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river. Near 
We found the story of Abraham. Sometimes it's so difficult to understand and comprehend. And uh, excellent, excellent lesson on it today. Still difficult to comprehend and understand um, because that puts sacrifice on a human level. However, all my life growing up from Sunday school to today, I. Just take for granted that Jesus came to this earth purposely to sacrifice himself, and that's for, for whatever reason that's a little more easier to understand. Although, uh, when you really think about it, it's amazing and to comprehend it is is. Something that uh, just don't think we uh, can understand the scope of it. Which is why, and I say this often when I'm up here, we meet every week so we don't forget and we don't just let it become something we learned in Sunday school that which is trivial. It is, it's real. The bread we are about to take represents his body that was broken on the cross. Keep that in mind as we give thanks for the bread. Father in heaven, we come to you at this time as we, as we do on a weekly basis. Thank you, Father, for your son who sacrificed himself, who gave up his life in a cruel and torturous way so that our sins can be forgiven. And we focus this time now on his body that was in agony as he suffered, suffered and died. We thank you for this bread that keeps us, keeps a constant reminder so that we do not forget. We pray through his name. is a reminder of his blood that was shed. Let's give thanks for that as well. We continue our thanks to you, Father, for your son's sacrifice and the spilling of his blood to wash away our sins so that we appear clean before you. We pray at this time that as we drink this cup, we 
do so that in a way that is pleasing to you in a worthy manner. In this time that we can reflect. And that we will use this time as well to as a way to strengthen ourselves so that when we go through this week, we can live our lives in honor of you. Again, we thank you so much for this, and it's through his name we pray. I know the Lord will find a way for me. I know the Lord will find a way for me. If I walk in heaven's light, shun the wrong and do the right, I know the Lord will find a way for me. The Lord has said, that we have to be able to contribute. We pray, Father, that your guidance will be upon us as we look to how to best utilize these funds. And we pray that our giving has been from the heart. And that uh, we will be able to uh, use use these funds to, to further the kingdom here grow as a congregation and reach out to the community and we pray through your son's name. Amen. As I said earlier, we normally go to nursing homes on the second second Sunday of the month, but given the weather call and cancel. Probably won't be there. So the next time we'll be at the nursing homes will be in April. Um, there will be no midweek Bible study this week because Marie and I are leaving today to go to Virginia. And Jonathan has something going on Wednesday as well. So 
Again, no midweek Bible study this week. Next Sunday is the third Sunday of the month. Um, oh, let me back up a day. There will be no men's fellowship on next this coming Saturday either. Because, again, I'm going to be out of town. Next Sunday, since I'm not going to be here, we're going to move the fifth Sunday worship to the third Sunday so that I will continue preaching through this sacrifice series through the end of the month. Uh, so next Sunday will be a Psalms and Scripture Sunday, uh, and there will be a fellowship following that around 11 o'clock or so, depending on when you guys break up downstairs. Um, other things that are going on this month, uh, potluck is the 24th, so plan for that. Uh, there will be a prayer breakfast on the morning of the 23rd, Saturday, March 23rd, here at the building at, I believe we said 8 o'clock. Is that correct? Anybody remember that? The secretary is not here, so I have no one to refute my discussion. So, 8 o'clock, Saturday the 23rd, here at the building. Are you going to agree with that, Frida? I just want to say that when you announced it, I wrote it down. Okay. So, 23rd, 8 o'clock, here at the building. Breakfast. Again, 24th is potluck. Now, the Last Sunday of the month, I think that's the 31st, or close to that. I, I don't have a calendar in my head right now, and I didn't write it down, but it's Easter Sunday, uh, Resurrection Sunday, so that kind of tells you what my sacrifice series is leading up to. Um, are there any other announcements that need to be made? Are we having snack and sing? No, we will not have sing and snack either. So let uh, let the folks in uh, Farmington know that as well. Thank you. Um, so just celebrate St. <laughs> <Saint> Patrick's Day. <laughs> However you do that. I'm going to see if I can find an orange shirt to wear. <laughs> and if you want to know why I do that, ask me later. Um, also, we found that I, I was messaging with Gretchen because a lot of people have been trying to call Paula and haven't been able to get through. Found out that Paula has been, is now recovering from COVID. So continue to pray for Paula. And then was it Friday? I think it was Friday. Yeah, that you took. Yeah. Uh, Carolyn was, went to the emergency room on Friday. She wasn't doing well. Uh, they diagnosed her with vertigo. So be praying for Carolyn as well. Um, anything else? Closing scripture is coming from the book of Hebrews, um, chapter 11, starting in verse 17. Hebrews 11, 17 through 19. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promise was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for gathering us here today safely. Thank you for this day that you've given to us. Father, help us to use all of our blessings in a way that is in accordance with your will. Help us to be good children. Father, watch over us through this coming week. Give us everything that we need to survive. Protect us from harm and from the evil one. 
Help us to forgive others the way that you forgive us. Help us to do what's right. Watch over us and guide us, Father, in Jesus' name.